Hello and welcome to this, the ninth episode of the Kurokawa Kurosawa cast. <laughs> uh, my name is Rob Beams and I'm joined as ever by my good friend Craig Ennis. Hello, Craig. Hello. Hello, how's it going? Yeah, good. It's a beautiful good, day. Good. The sun is shining. It's nice and warm. Perfect, Excellent. perfect day to be sat inside with a headphone on talking Excellent. about football. I actually killed a mosquito in the shower this morning, uh, so it's too hot in Barcelona, if that's <laughs> starting to happen again. Anyway, uh, we are here talking today about uh, Ikiru, uh, one of the early kind of acknowledged masterpieces of Kurosawa. Um, probably this and Rashomon are the ones we've watched so far that are kind of in the the, the higher echelons of, of um, what's considered his canon anyway. I have no idea Craig's opinion on it yet, but you know that's where it's sort of considered. Um and uh, Ikiru, for those who don't know, the, the literal translation, I think it's a verb, I think it's to live. Uh, and Ikiru is about um, Takashi Shimura, who everyone who's listened to the other episodes will know I am a big fanboy of. I love love a bit of Takashi Shimura. Takashi Shimura kind of comes out of Mifune's shadow in this one. Toshiro Mifune's not in this. Shimura's front and centre. He plays this uh, guy called Watanabe, who's like a local, kind of a middling bureaucrat. He's like, the, the, he's he, you know, he's not one of the top bosses, but he's not one of the underlings. He's a kind of middle manager bureaucrat. And he works, he's the same section chief yeah but he's yeah, got loads of people a lot. yeah but there's a lot of people he has to report to and he's got people reporting to him but the point is he's kind of in the middle of this bureaucratic system he's just got papers all on his desk and he's not really achieving anything in life the, the there's a narration to this one which kind of spells out that this guy you know he's not doing anything worthwhile he's not really living and then we get um his diagnosis basically he gets he gets diagnosed with with cancer he realizes he's only got about six months probably to live so he's the film is basically about his quest to find some kind of meaning and to inject meaning into his life and to finally try and live and that's basically the movie uh and it's kind of divided into it's a game of two halves isn't it craig it kind of i was thinking i was i was, I was, I was <laughs> thinking that exact phrase just yeah. before we got on <laughs> I was going to okay. do a quick analogy. <laughs> so, um, do you want to go into a more detailed run through of, of, of the film, or is that sort of a good, a good, good summary? I think to that's kick a good start. Start. I mean, if we talk about the tech game of two halves, like you know, the start. Obviously, we see the um, we see his kind of uh, we see the sort of status quo in his life up to that point. Then he gets his diagnosis, and then he kind of, um, kind of latches onto some people, goes on a bender. Um, kind of tries sort of samples life a little bit for the first mm. half of the film um, to varying degrees of success. And then the second half is uh, his wake, basically. And it's uh, people that he's worked with and his son, his daughter-in-law, sitting around in a room, uh, getting progressively more drunk and talking about um, the role that he may or may not have played in building a park. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, and yeah, it, that, you get... That, you get that, at the very beginning a bunch of old women are trying to get this sewage uh, kind of kind of like the area. If people listen to our earlier episodes, it's sort of like this is the solution to the area at the beginning of Drunken Angel. You know, there's that just big like swamp bit, in the middle yeah, of the town. I was going to say that it, it's a solution to all the swamps in all his films so far. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I can't think of a film that ha you haven't seen a swamp in. <laughs> So basically, there's some sort of open sewage sump in the middle of some neighbourhood, and these old ladies have been going around petitioning, trying to get a park made so that kids can play and that they're not getting sick from this sewage. And uh, we see at the beginning this park is an example of how the system works because they get. We'll talk more about this because this is an amazing sequence, but how they get shunted from place to mm. place and nothing gets done. And so yes, in the second half of the film starts where Shimura finds the um this petition again for the park and then decides that this is the thing he's going to do to give meaning to his life. Um and up before that point, I mean he tries finding meaning in just hedonism, doesn't he? He tries to mm. he tries to go around and get drunk and get laid and whatever, just goes into the red light district and and tries, you know, has a sing and, and goes to strip clubs and all that. That doesn't give him any solace. He he tries to find meaning in in his son, uh, and and finds that himself so alienated from his son as well. And we get another really nice montage with his relationship with his son as well. Uh, he tries to find meaning in a kind of an early kind of proto manic pixie dream girl as well, who who then kind of turns around and he's like, oh, tell me your secret. How are you like this? And she's like, I just I just work and I eat. I don't do anything else. Like just leave me alone. <laughs> um, and. Uh, 
so, so he tries to find solace in all these places and is, is like you say, kind of largely unsuccessful in that and then finds meaning in this public works thing. And as you say, the second half is this really interesting way. It's kind of a, it's kind of a bottle movie. That, that The it's second a, half of this it, movie is a bottle so movie, half, isn't it? The second half of the movie is very seems very much like a play to me. Like mm. very, very, it's very, it gets quite stagey. And uh, anyway, let's, let's, we'll, we'll get yeah. to that. Should we start okay. So let's, let's look... start with where we always start, which is what were your preconceptions before you went in? My preconce... For people, for people that haven't listened before, the gimmick is I'm the one who's seen them all. Uh, and I'm a sort of a Curacao fan and Craig is coming at all these new, coming at all of them completely fresh. So what's your, what was your sort of preconception going in? Like I said, I think I said in last week, like this, the, the, the synopsis reminded me a lot of, um, like um the blur album the great escape which is all about um which seems to be all about sort of dissatisfaction with um uh suburban life across the whole album all the tracks are it seem to be about middle-aged men who are going through midlife crises um and that's kind of um which is weird because i think they, they couldn't have even been 30 when they wrote that album they must have been in their mid-20s um but that's what it made me think of um that sort of thing and rise and fall of reginald perrin and that kind of thing which i've never i've never seen but but i feel like from from you know it's such a oft quoted part of british comedy that i often that i often feel like i've watched it um i thought it was going to be in that sort of territory i was expecting a kind of um sort of sort of uh you know middle-aged man in a kind of in a midlife in a sort of a midlife crisis kind of um film and and there is there is definitely an element of that that's what i was expecting like i say i think i also said last week that it's the sort of thing that i can very much envisage being like a toby jones film um you know in 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 to put it in sort of british terms and I think it's I think it's really quite similar to that for the for, for, from what I was expecting to for the first half of the film. I love the opening like um the set of City Hall is so well done like all the different rooms and departments and the kind of repeated kind of patterns of the offices. But the kind of introduction to uh Wantanabe's brilliant where he's sort of sat at this desk and there is this mountain of paperwork with bound in paper, just sort of higgledy-piggledy behind him. Like, mm. he's just sat there sort of sifting through bits of paper. And you get the sense that it doesn't matter how long he'll sit there, that that paper will always be there behind him, in front of him. To, and, like, just shifting bits of paper from one side of a desk to another, not achieving anything. Um, it feels to me a lot like this film is... Um, you know how early on in his filmography, when we were first... What doing this podcast? We watched uh, One Wonderful Sunday and um, Scandal, which were films that, to me at the time, I said at the time, felt very much like Capra movies. Um, this is a Capra movie, of those, yeah. and this is a Capra movie. But the thing is, is that like those ones were kind of rough gems, you know, the the kind yeah. of elements in them that were good, elements in them that were not so great. This this seems to be the pinnacle because he doesn't really go into this sort of territory again. Like he makes right. other like contemporary set movies but i wouldn't say until maybe his final film madadeo that he ever really goes back into this sort of territory and it feels like this is like the the pinnacle like he's polished doing that type of movie with this one because it doesn't it, it, it doesn't get leaden with any of the same sort of sentimentality it doesn't really get um kind of bogged down in extended sequences that that that, that ought to be kind of 20 minutes shorter like some of them do um also like uh, a few people that i've read um are talking around this film both donald ritchie in his famous films of kurosawa book but also um someone called Catherine russell who's uh, another scholar of, of japanese cinema whose book i recently bought um both talk about how they see this film and shimura's role in it as like um, a more polished refined evolution of the character shimura plays in scandal right you know, he yeah. plays the father in that who um, hasn't been living his life well and needs to kind of learn to be better mm. effectively. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it does a really... I think there is definitely... I think one of the other things that... There is obviously a, a, a massive um, kind of almost... There's almost sort of Clarkson levels of this this uh, this um, Dane for bureaucracy in this film as well, which, <laughs> which kind of... Uh, which which are laid out at, at, at the start, like 
you know, and I think that's um, like you say, it never gets particularly saccharine. There, there seems to, it seems to be quite barbed actually about the way mm. that politics and bureaucracy works. Um, like the scene where the montage at the beginning where they bring the petition, the women bring the petition, and it just gets handed sort of to camera uh, from camera to these different. Oh, you need the sanitation department. Oh, you need the parks yeah. department. Oh, you need the public works department. All that kind of thing. It some of just, them, some of those departments are very gently undermined as well. Like you get the, the oh, go to pest control, and then when you get to pest control, it's a guy who's like plagued with flies, trying to like swat them away. So like it shows the it, just the lack of them able to get anything done, even in their own office. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, um, yeah, no, I, I, I found the, the the opening section of this film absolutely charming, just sort of in terms of laying out its. Um, Laying out the background to the film, to laying out the kind of the the status quo, the the kind of just lay, the lay of the land was just perfectly encaptured in the first ten minutes, in such with such efficiency, um, the character and the environment and the world is just sort of just put out, just completely on front street. Like this is mm. this is this is the milieu. This is where we're going to be starting from. Um, works so beautifully, nicely. It's really uh, economical as well because in the first um, the first few minutes of the movie, really, but within the first five to ten minutes, you get the setup that he's got this cancer. You get shown exactly where this guy works. As you say, they do a really good job of establishing this this office he works in. He's very hunched and he's signed by his papers and all the various characters in his office. Sort of, you get a sense of some of that. You also get the these women coming in talking about the playgrounds. You set up the idea of the playground right away. Um, you get the impression really strongly straight away that he's dedicated his whole life to very pointless work. And all of that comes in the opening minutes. And that's basically the setup for the entire movie. It's It's very economical, I think, the way that's all done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're told even before you meet him, like our, our, our protagonist, this is our protagonist's stomach. He's got cancer. He doesn't know it yet. It's like, oh, okay. Like there's no, there is no, you know, the best you can hope for from the start is going to be some sort of bittersweet humanist ending, mm. isn't it? Like, it's never going to be resolved in a, in a happy way, this film. And you, you kind of know that straight from the start. Um, and then it's, <laughs> there's a nice bit of nice bit of scene where he goes to the kind of and it, the, the, that's kind of reiterated as well, isn't it? Because he goes to the doctors because he's got these stomach aches, and he's waiting at the doctors. And this other fella says, uh, "Oh, you know, they they told him it's an ulcer, but it was really cancer, and he, was, he only had five months to live, and he had all these symptoms and blah blah." Then he goes to the doctor, tells him his symptoms, and they go, "Oh, it's an ulcer." You know, <laughs> you know, and he, and he just sort of realizes that that they're lying to him, basically. Mm. Um, but it's just kind of like, no, he's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to die. It just it doesn't let up from that. It's kind of there is no um, uh, there's no sort of way out of this situation. It's like, no, you, this is our setup, and we're going to we're going to this is what we're working with from the start. There's not you're not waiting for a some sort of medical. Um, you're not expecting waiting or even promise some sort of medical miracle to save him. He's it's just, okay. It, what's he going to do with his final months? Basically. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Maybe we can talk about this some more at the end, but I know you said, I think you might've said last time that Bill Nye is actually going to be in a British remake of Akiru. Right. Hmm. And there are certain things in this film. I can see them having to change or that, that will be sort of changed with the times i think one of them is not telling him the diagnosis because i mean did you see the um uh the kind of chinese american film yeah, well yeah, well there seems to be a culture i guess that when i first saw this film i wasn't aware of of not telling people their terminal diagnosis like old people i guess i'm guessing that that's not just that he made that up for akiru because obviously in farewell it's exactly the same right this chinese lady has this terminal cancer and yeah. no one will tell her um and i wonder like that's not really how we do things like in the uk so i can imagine instead of having someone go Oh, Bill, they're going to tell you it's an ulcer, but don't worry, you've got five months. He'll probably just have a frank conversation with his doctor. I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that remake, just, just as a sideline, we will talk about it more later, but I think that's that is going to be set in the 50s post war kind of oh, right. period piece. It's not an update, it's not a modern update. Yeah. Oh, interesting. That's fascinating, actually. And that's actually a very good shout, I would say. I think that's possibly quite good. Anyway, um, so. 
another thing I want to mention, this is this is really minor and it, it's irrelevant really, but it 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 points to something for me I think is really great about Kurosawa in general and really great about you know great filmmakers, something that they consistently are able to do with space. Uh, and, and making things feel lived in and alive is the fact that when he gets his diagnosis, when they tell him it's an ulcer, there's the kind of um, screen grab shot that you always see if you Google images of Kira of him kind of looking at the camera like, you know, devastated with the doctors in the background. But before that bit, he drops his coat. He's about to put his coat like on the back of a chair or something. And he just drops his coat on the floor while he's stunned. And then he turns around. He doesn't get, pick his coat up. He turns around. He starts talking to the doctors, begging for them to tell him the truth. And the nurse is obviously finding this whole thing uncomfortable and just looks for something to do to occupy herself. She walks kind of out of frame and picks up his coat and folds it up and puts it somewhere. And I absolutely love that detail because it makes you feel like the whole thing is in one continuous take. The whole thing is in one space. Like it isn't just that mm -hmm. he incidentally dropped his coat in that shot and then continuity wise, you know, forget about the coat. It doesn't matter that the coat is still there on the floor out of frame. And you feel that and you feel that the, the nurse has seen it, that she's going to address it. And it's like, it doesn't really, you know, it's not for, there's no meaning behind it here. It's not saying anything about like post-war Japan. The coat isn't a metaphor, but it's like, I just, I love that. I think all of the best directors, the ones I like the most, um, things like that enable you to get immersed in their worlds that they create. Yeah, because there, there, there is that sense of space. There is, and there's other sense, there's other sort of senses of lived in details as well. Like, so after he, after he leaves, there's this nice little bit of kind of subjective sound where he's, he's wandering out of the, out of the hospital stunned and it's silent then all of a sudden the noise of the street kicks in and then um there's this kind of strange uh well there's this, this kind of series of kind of reflections on his life where he remembers his wife dying and going to the funeral with his boy and the the, the body being in the car in front and he's there with his brother and his his sister-in-law and his son and um the car kind of goes around a corner and, and his son sort of says, mummy's leaving us behind. It's a really kind of heartbreaking little kind of moment. And then he's thinking about some other things and he thinks that it kind of cuts between him sort of wandering around. And then there's a scene with his son, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, but it's son and his daughter-in-law, but um, they ask him to sort of lock up and um, he expect he goes to lock up um and he he remembers this baseball game with his son but it's all kind of predilected on this fact that like the, the, the door's broken and they have to wedge a baseball bat in in the door <laughs> to sort of get it secure and it's just like oh you know it's this really nice little detail of unnecessary detail of um this sort of lived in slightly worn slightly mm. shabby house where he's kind of gone to work lived and never really spent any money or done anything or Oh. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good spot. Actually, that's a really interesting detail. I the stuff with his son for me is the most heartbreaking stuff in the whole movie, because it's never resolved. Like there mm. is no, there's nothing where. Like I wonder if they'll change this in the Bill Nye version for the audience's sake. That before he dies, his son will have to say, "Actually, Dad, I know you're a good bloke, and I've always loved you." Because <laughs> what <laughs> happens in Akiru is that he overhears, he's, he basically, I think, is going to tell his son and his daughter-in-law about his diagnosis. So he's waiting for them to get home to tell them, I think. right? Yeah. And what actually scary. happens is they walk in and they don't know he's in the room waiting for them. So they're just chatting shit about him, talking about how he, oh, we, we need to get, you know, we need to get use his money. money. He saves up too much. We just need all his money and his pension so we can get a better house. And if he doesn't like it, we'll just tell him we're leaving and all this and he'll have to deal with it. And they're being a bit, you know, you know, it, they're not being that awful, but they're awful in the context of he can hear them saying this stuff and it's not nice. So they get in the room. He's heard that and he thinks all these people care about me is my money, whatever. Uh, they don't really care, I suppose. So he kind of decides to kind of shuffle off. He never, there's never a moment where he's able to, you know, that, that shakes his relationship with his son, right? To the point where he goes to the, he meets this person from his office who's the Manic Pixie Dream Girl character played by, um, She's called Mickey Odegiri, and she's not really in very many other films um, in general, but she's really good in this. And she um, she tells him when he's complaining about his son, 
like no i'm sure your son still loves you and you still love your son and you should go and you know talk to him so he tries again with his son and this time his son tells him off for hanging out with that girl and insists he's having some tawdry affair uh which he's not having and so you get this great and, sense the, and, the, of, and the point and the point of that conversation is like you do what you want but we want a will sorted before yeah we want the money yeah. exactly yeah yeah and so and so the thing is you get this great sense of injustice where um not only is his son berating him, but he's berating him for things that uh, aren't fair. And in, in the case of the thing with the woman and the affair aren't true um, and treating him very shabbily in response to that. And even at the wake at the start, they still maintain this idea that, oh, he was different in the last months. Oh, that's because he was having an affair, dirty old bastard. So they, there's this real <laughs> sense of injustice that you think with the son, like that never yeah. gets resolved and that you kind of, is kind of the hardest thing to take in the whole movie is that well, there's a couple of resolved. things isn't there because like they 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 speculate at the wake that he knew he was dying and that was the reason why he pursues this pike park um and son says what he would have told me and it's like mm, you know have a word with yourself and then <laughs> and then and then that then then they discover that like he he'd left the um the retirement bonus like instructions and paperwork before he goes out to the park and presumably he, he, there's this weird thing. She's not quite sure how he died or that he's got a sense that he's going to die there and then, but either way he goes, goes to this park to, to expire. Um, but he leaves the paperwork in, in order for his son. It's like, well, I'll leave you the, you know, of course I'm going to leave you the money. Like, um, and so it's like, I don't know. Yeah. It's really kind of, yeah, bittersweet and, and and unresolved, and um, you know, the, 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 he gets his he gets what he was worried. The son gets what he was worried about, but never any kind of resolution hmm. of the relationship with his father, who's who stayed who stayed unmarried and single for seemingly for his son's sake throughout his throughout his life after his wife's death as well for for no. You know, for no, yeah, no personal gain in any of it. Yeah, the a really lovely piece about this, the the uh, montage he sees of his son's life because, as you say, it starts with the wife's funeral and the looking after the son that day, and it kind of goes through the son's life. Uh, but the final memory he has of his son in that montage is of his son going off to war as a soldier, mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's no, even though this is in fifty two. So this is seven years after the war. So minimum seven years after his son's come back, this is set. And he has no happy memories of him and his son after the war. And to me, that suggests that his son came back a changed man. That, that there's that that's an element of the situation that doesn't really go spoken about in the film, but to me is kind of suggested there. It's just like, well, my son went off to war and then it was different then. And we don't have those memories after that. And, and I, I thought that was really interesting. And it, it kind of was yeah like an interesting kind of un unsaid thing about it because you know you could easily have had another scene coming in the reason i think it's quite intentional is the next logical flashback is welcoming his son back from war or another logical thing to then think about is his son's marriage and going to his son's wedding but he doesn't think about any of those things it stops when his son goes to war and he doesn't have yeah. that relationship with him after that yeah i mean you know there is there is um when we talk about sort of underserved female characters as well there is this kind of um the the the, the daughter-in-law is sort of set up as the one who's pushing for the money as well and kind of mm. we, don't, we don't dig into their relationship at all she's just the she's literally just the wife of the son who lives with them who wants to make sure that they're financially secure um so that that's never really dug into either is it but um no but you know um, another another detail I want to mention just from the early part of the movie, actually, before we move on from there, is that the um, uh, the women who come in and uh, originally put the the petition in and have to go from desk to desk. When uh, when it doesn't get sorted, one of them shouts, um, "You call this democracy?" And that that might seem like it doesn't have a lot of power to it, or it's not like you know, it could just be like, oh, you know, like. Um, it could be the equivalent of someone just saying you call this fair or something like that. But in the context of early 50s Japan, they're, they're moving, the society is rapidly moving mm. towards democracy. So it's it's much more loaded. It's much more of a comment on uh, kind of the old people going, oh, it's better in the old days. We got things done then before this democracy came in. It becomes a lot more... Um, yeah loaded as a phrase i think so i wanted to bring that up because i think it's interesting and because also we've had uh one of kurosawa's partridge like rants 
in the previous uh, episodes where we talked about his autobiography, um, I think was was him kind of complaining about kind of um, uh, <laughs> the one about how he wished actually he regretted they'd lost the war because of a lady that that complained about something one of his films, an American lady. Uh, and I, I, I kind of feel sometimes in Kurosawa's movies you get a hint of that kind of like you said, Jeremy Clarkson, but that kind of bitter old partridge in him. There is there, is, there yeah, is a lot of that in this, in the way that. Like, Late, especially later on in the, in the wake scenes, the way that people are arguing over, um, over people are arguing over the credit and you know deferring to their superiors and um, sort of talking about um, uh, what is it? Um, oh God, I didn't write it down. There was something about um, uh, everybody has to appear like they're doing something without actually doing anything. No one's allowed, you know, without actually changing anything. Nobody wants any actual change, but everybody needs to pretend they're busy and that kind of thing. There's also a really strange little bit of business as well with with a load of reporters who who come in out, outraged that um, at Watanabe's funeral that he hasn't had any um, credit for this park, as if like the local press is really interested, really interested in, in it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is exactly. quite funny. Um, and then and you keep getting the uh, the deputy mayor having to talk to people like, look, this is how. Look, I'm sorry, I know we're at his funeral, but I'm just gonna. I shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna say it. He had nothing to do with that part, by the way. That was all me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and you kind of get the sense as well that the real the real wake starts when the really high ups leave, yeah, don't they? Like yeah. it's really awkward. Like it's the most awkward. So I was saying to my wife watching it, like, imagine having to sit there as the family just entertaining this like row of like local cats <laughs> and how how much you'd want them to fuck off you know and then it is like that like when they leave there is the bit where like the uncle the the brother of, of watanabe is like okay everyone come on sit around and they kind of get less formal and they start kind of actually eating and drinking and talking more freely yeah, there's a lot, but, of, yeah. lot of drinking gets very very drunken speaking of which yeah so after the after the kind of initial kind of bust up with his son um, he does what I guess most people do in the situation and kind of goes on a bit of a bender. He's not quite sure how to do it, but winds up in a local bar having a drink. And there's a fella asking for um, indigestion tablets or something. And he looks a lot like with now kind of got <laughs> dressed, dressed up, got this hat on kind of, uh, and he, he offers him this, uh, this, um, these tablets and refuses payment for him. He says, all right, well, I'll buy you a drink. And he, sort of confides in this guy that he wants to enjoy his, his last days, but he doesn't know how. And the guy kind of sort of finds that he's a writer of, um, of cheap novels, as he calls himself, and um, sort of decides that um, he kind of takes upon himself as this noble act to sort of lead this bender and sort of refuses refu even ref even refuses like um once an offered to pay for it or he's like no i'm going to show you the town and they get um there's this beautiful kind of scene long sustained take where they're talking at the table about about life and everything and then they go off out into the town to the sort of pachenko halls and beer halls and parties and i, I was just thinking like from this and stray dog and um i think it was maybe I can't remember the other, but like Kurosawa really knows how to um, film a party with. with I think light. in Drunken Angel, there's that cabaret yeah. act as well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Like they, he, he does it with a lot of. Um, there's a lot of energy in his kind of party scenes in these sort of red light district scenes. A little bit too much, really. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he knows he knows these places really, really well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the things from this era of Japanese cinema. It's probably the same in 50s Hollywood cinema as well. But like one of the things of Japanese cinema in this era, if you read about any of the people involved, is they were all drunk all the time outside right. of making movies. Like like Kurosawa and Ozu and, you know, I'm not sure about Mizuguchi, but a lot of these guys, they were all like, as soon as filming stopped for the day, everyone went to the bar and they spent all their money on alcohol. Okay. So yeah, he's very familiar with these places, as you say. And I think that shows. I really like the detail of the pianist. There's a pianist singing kind of like a jazzy number, isn't there, in one of the bars? And I love his big beer. With his big beer, and there's yeah, <laughs> the, the sort of the boogie woogie kind of, and the piano, and the kind of the mirror yeah. shot pans down. There's also a great Shimura reaction where this kind of trombone comes in from screen screen right, <laughs> and it kind of looks up and 
reacts to it. Um, it's, it's, it's a really relatable, even though this is 1950s Japan, it's a really relatable night out because, like, I think we've probably all been there where you're like, you have someone you become like a best friend of for the night who you never see again in the rest of your life. Yeah. Like you just latch onto some person and the two of you have all these moments and you get really close, but it's like just for that night drinking. And then they have a really realistic version of the taxi journey home afterwards, where I said to my wife, Gemma, I was watching, I said, I think I've been every single person in this taxi. <laughs> apart from the driver. <laughs> like the way the way that Shimura is like bent down during the taxi journey, just like yeah. <laughs> he's completely gone. And they've got these they've got these two women who are still up for it and laughing and singing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the writer who's trying to like make sure his mate's okay, you know. Like yeah. It's so relatable. It yeah. could be West Street in Brighton, circa yeah. two thousand. Like it's, it is that sort of that drunken odyssey where you kind of find yourself you do find yourself um without your sort of usual crowd and just seeing where the night takes you and and it it it, it just comes across perfectly it just comes across perfectly um such a lovely lovely sequence um and that sort of leads on to him like i say he doesn't see him again but he, he runs into the 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 girl from the office uh, a girl from the office the next day that who's you mentioned the actress actress's name yeah, uh, it's Mickey, uh, Odegiri. Mickey Odegiri, yeah. He's playing Toyo um, Odegiri. So, you know, not, not a huge stretch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so she's kind of like, everyone's been speculating because he's not been at work for, for, for five days, and he's like this metronomic constant that, that everybody kind of um, – sets their sets their watch by and as long as Montanabi's in the office they know what what's going on so everyone's a little bit kind of um put out by it and he runs into her and she's kind of fascinated as to why he's not been in and he kind of just it, they he kind of they start getting into a conversation about how how boring the office is and she decides to um sort of they sort of sort of despite um uh decide to spend the day together and he kind of he starts by taking her to the pachenko parlor doesn't he because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what he's learned now <laughs> <laughs> he's learned how to live and it's yeah out to, the, to the town yeah it's uh it's really interesting actually the um like i said she's a bit of a proto mary pixie dream girl this character and from everything i've read around it she is was a really surprising kind of breath of fresh air character in early fifties Japanese cinema. Cause she's kind of sarcastic and she's does, she's not, you know, she's not in any way demure or anything. She's just a very br kind of brash outspoken, very effervescent woman in this film. Uh, and it's kind of considered a weird tragedy. I don't think she died or anything. Like, I don't think it's a tragedy in that sense, but just that this person really isn't in very many other films at all. But it's interesting. The um, Catherine Russell book I talked about earlier, I, got this what Catherine Russell book classical Japanese cinema um because I've been reading her book about uh Mikio Narusi and her book on Narusi is like the kind of fourth kind of most renowned Japanese director of the 50s uh is about specifically about feminism and women in Japanese cinema women in modernity in Japanese cinema in the 50s and the way that women were depicted so I was really interested to read her book in general to find out kind of with that in mind if her scope is coming from that end of things what she thinks of kurosawa's films and actually it's interesting she mentions in here his deficiencies with female characters but then talks about how akira is her favorite kurosawa film because of this character being the the kind of the the female character in all of his work who has the most the most kind of life and agency seemingly and the fact as well i think that as i said earlier she she kind of doesn't take his shit either like everything no. happens on her terms like he he latches himself onto her and she says, look, you're creepy and this is uncomfortable. He tries to get to him. She tries to get him to go away. And then she takes pity on him and says, okay, we can go for one more lunch. And when he starts projecting onto her all of this, like, oh, you know how to live though. You're the, you're the only person who, who actually can show me what it is to live. He, um, she doesn't take on that responsibility at all. And she actually kind of bursts his bubble and says, look, I, like I said earlier, like she says, look, I don't do anything. I work and I eat and I sleep and that's all my life is. Yeah. And you've got these ideas about me and you're projecting all this stuff on me, but I'm not your salvation. Like that's not who yeah. I am. It's interesting. It is interesting, isn't it? Because she kind of is inspired by him to 
quit the job that she hates and go off and work a, a less uh, lucrative job. There's a great bit where he meets her outside of work and she's working inside this kind of um, shed full of machinery and the door's rattling from the sound of the machinery. It's really kind of, it's really, um, it's really quite an evocative piece of produ production design, excuse me. But that's it. But, you know, she gets, once she's kind of, you know, he gets to spend the day with her and kind of enjoy himself. She gets to sort of, um, uh, she she's inspired and kind of changes her life. But at the same time, she's not going to, like you say, take his shit and carry on doing this. And fight. she finds it all a little bit weird and she doesn't mm. want to, she kind of, it's all like, it's all on her own terms. Like she's, she's with him for as long as it kind of makes sense and, feels right and they're having fun and then she's like no look come on you're much older i've got a life i've got work like yeah you know this is too intense now yeah. back on and she's she's the one who kind of gives him the epiphany about the park isn't she because she says look mm. i left that place because it's meaningless so now i make these little mechanized bunny toys for kids and i feel i find meaning in that because i'm making something that kind of gives joy to children and then he's like Oh, okay. Doing something that gives joy to children. What about that park? You know, that kind of sets off, sets him up on his last, uh, last act, doesn't it? Really, that and he kind of gets of, this idea. And he gets back to the office, and they they are um, kind of surprised to see him when they come in. And he's taking the bits of paper down, finds the park thing at the top, and like grabs it, and then he's he's off on his way to make this park. Mm. Um, There's something beautiful there actually that we haven't talked about yet that was actually in that office area and it's earlier in the film as well is those kind of underlings of his who are like eyeing up his desk while he's gone you get the you get the bit where kind of really early on you see two of them um, there's like a conversation at lunch like there's kind of a lunch scene there and people are talking about how well if Watanabe's off then um, look think about how many promotions away we are we've got to wait for other people to die and then it cuts to a couple of those like slightly older people kind of looking furtively at each other and at his desk and then before <laughs> When he does eventually come back, you see those same people kind of eyeing up his desk, looking a bit disappointed that he's back, you know? Yes. And so that it's beautiful the way that it sets up how absolutely pointless and soul-destroying and crushing his life is in this position. And also how in that game, everyone wants his chair, you know? <laughs> so sorry, what were you going to say about it? And I was going to say, and then he's dead. Um, like, yeah. that's the that's the game of two halves, isn't it? Mm. It kind of gets to that point. And then the, the, the kind of the left turn did kind of... Um, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting the second half to have this completely different narrative structure to it. Like the first half is this kind of as more or less as you'd expect with a few flashbacks. And then the second half of the film is all this kind of bottle movie in a wake. And it's actually quite a while. I know you're saying there wasn't any overlong scenes, but there's quite a while before we, I knew we were going to see Shimura again because we hadn't been to the park and there's that famous image of him on the swings. So I was expecting him to see him. But the kind of the initial stuff where all the kind of big wigs are there at the um, at the funeral sitting down, it's all very formalised, you've got the shrine and all that kind of thing. It does go on for a little while. Um, just, just, just a little. It's the only bit that kind of that, that, that I found dragged a little bit. But um, it's lovely how they're talking about it because the reporters turn up and they they they, they want to know about why their big question and what sets the rest of it in motion is why was Wantanabe not mentioned at the opening of the park? Everybody says that he opened this park and they're like, well, you know, actually, you think a middle management um, uh, drone could do this? No, this takes a deputy mayor. You know, this is this is my project. It's like, well, you just <laughs> wanted to be re-elected. And he talks about and they, the way they talk about the opening of this little part. They call it epoch making project at one point <laughs> as well, which I picked up. But they're all about this is a, you know this is a this is a this is a monumental project for the city and blah blah. And everyone's kind of clambering to take credit for it, and and people are saying, well, you know, it was him. He he wanted to. He was the one who kept it going, or he was the one who really built it. Or and there is this discussion. It becomes this discussion really about. Um, about sort of collectivism and people's roles and like it takes all the departments together but do you need do you need someone to connect these departments do you need somebody who's actually got that that passion to push it forwards even if they can't do it fully on their own are they the ones that have got the bit between their teeth who are actually making things happen um and it becomes yeah it, it becomes this kind of 
meditation really on kind of individual achievement versus collective achievement which i really liked really really liked um and as they all kind of and they start to speculate on whether or not he knew he was dying and and all this kind of, and you get these flashbacks and the story of of how he continued to pursue this project really um and you get that lovely scene of um, some Yakuza guys try to lean on him, don't they? The, the, yeah. Uh, the, like the guys from Drunken Angel turn up, basically, and try to lean on him. And um, they say, look, this park isn't in our interest for whatever reason. I think they want to develop something else there. Which, like would all, which would also solve some of the issues if it's the sewage that's the problem. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like, i mean ultimately oh yeah ultimately yeah. We're talking about this tree like either yeah, way yeah, yeah. Like, either way uh but anyway so they talk about how they're gonna they want to open a red light district there and he back off and that the, the toughs and their like gang leader seem to just leave unnerved by the fact that shimura is just completely not afraid to die you know like yeah. that's what i took from it is that they kind of stare him down and threaten him and he just stares back at them and uh they're kind of like that it seems like he gets his way because he's not afraid of them in the way that they're used to officials being afraid of them because he's got nothing to live for apart from doing this park. You know, it's kind of an interesting little sequence. Yeah. But yeah. I like, I, I like the wake. I didn't find it. I don't find it over long. Cause I think the, the room in it to breathe, there's a lot of pregnant pauses of like these, these government toadies eyeing each other up and nobody wanting to say the wrong thing towards the deputy mayor and everyone politicking and there's very few people in the room and it only take it only comes out as they start to get drunk um, who are actually willing to say truth to power, you know. And even then, power in the air quotes, where it's like, say truth to their immediate manager, you know, <laughs> like in the room because it's all the yeah. like the, the big people leave. <laughs> I just found I just found as, as as a left turn. I just found it kind of a little bit disorientating, and it 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 took a while to get there. It pays off perfectly well. It just it just for 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 fifteen minutes or so, I was thinking, oh, this is it's taken an unexpected turn, and I wasn't quite ready to go with it for mm. until it had kind of done a little bit of that work and kind of you know I can it's. It, yeah, it goes from being that sort of it goes from sort of Capra to, to Ianucci quite quickly, <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, oh, okay, you know, I think and then on on the strength of um, on the strength of something like um, personal history of David Copperfield, I, I think Ianucci could actually do quite a good Capra film, but um, but I wasn't expecting it, and I, I, and it became. In the, it became this bottle film, became a little bit stagey, and people started sort of telling the plot and telling the, the point of the story rather than showing mm. it. And But sort of after 15, 20 minutes or so, they start kicking back in with the flashbacks, and you start seeing things happen again. And I started to go with it, and as it deteriorated, there's a, there's a, I love the film, I love Ben Wheatley's High Rise. I know it, not, it's, it wasn't... Um, I know it wasn't really... Um, it wasn't really beloved by everybody, but what I love about that film is where you start and where you end uh, from sort of a banal, a, a banal sort of retro futuristic start to complete insanity at the end mm. that it, it feels like a constant um, sl slide. It's like a, it's a, it's a smooth gradient. And um, when it kicks off being crazy, it's, you've never noticed that you've already slipped into crazy in that film. And I, that's what I love about it. And what I felt here, like this, the gradient, although I was, I was surprised to be on it, like to be put on it at the start, there is a really smooth gradient into that as they, people start getting more and more drunk and you start understanding the story more and more. Um, I, I thought the kind of the pay, you know, that kind of, slide in towards the end i thought was was handled really really smoothly it was just literally it was just such an abrupt turn um and i was thinking and i was aware of the running time and i'm thinking there's still an hour and 20 minutes of this left and i was like Whoa. so I, it was more of a kind of um it was more of me kind of just finding that change a little bit too abrupt the first time i watched it i'm sure if i watched yeah. it, it it might it might be less um it's Unexpected. It's interesting. It's interesting. There's a there, there's a long running um, Japanese 
kind of cinema um, award, I guess, a, a poll uh, similar to the Sight and Sound one we have in the UK. Sight and Sound magazine obviously do their yearly best films poll with with critics. Uh, Japan's been having that for years. It's called the Kinema Junpo uh, poll, and they have this magazine going back a long time, like Sight and Sound that <clears throat> lists what they think the greatest films of all time are periodically and also lists the best films for each year. And what was interesting reading Donald Ritchie's account with Ikiru is that um, Ikiru topped that poll um, the year it came out in Japan. Uh, so it was really critically acclaimed. It topped the Junpo poll for, for, for 1952. Um, but then uh, there was criticism at the time, he says, of its length and saying it was too long. And he gives this interesting anecdote about it where um, he was presenting in the 60s. He was doing a retrospective. Donald Richard was putting on a retrospective of Kurosawa films at some festival in Berlin or somewhere, I think. And... Um, uh, David O. Selznick, the American producer, was there, and he was going to give this award to like the great. I think it was like the greatest film of all time, or one of the greatest films of all time. He's going to give this like prestigious Dave, David O. Selznick award, and he was considering between um, works of all the kind of fifties legends of world cinema. There were Bergman films in the mix, and there were you know all of all of these things were in the in the running for it, and he eventually. <laughs> gave the award to Ikiru. Um, but one of Selznick's people went to Donald Ritchie, who was curating this film festival, and was going to give this award to Ikiru. Uh, and he said to uh, he said to Ritchie, uh, Mr. O. Selznick's going to give his you know golden whatever Selznick award to Ikiru. But he does he does want to know if you can cut 20 minutes off it because he is of the opinion that it's too long. So, <laughs> so there is so there's this it's, it's an amazing thing where he on one hand acknowledges it as like possibly the greatest film of all time, but also wants an edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, my, my my feeling watching it I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know I've, I've got sympathies for Selznick there. I feel like it was, <laughs> It was there were moments when that when that went on a little bit too long, but that was the only real kind of um, that was the only that was the only time that I was sort of kind of a little bit itchy with it. And then it, it, it ends really strongly, you know. It gets to the point where where you see him, he's got this park, he's nice and happy, and then there's the the kind of the actual ending where there's people, kids actually playing in it, and um, and and somebody standing on the bridge sort of looking over it remembering um montanabi fondly and it's it's lovely you know it's really kind of there is a sense that this this man with the last kind of few months in his life has made an impact in the world um that will be felt whether or not he's acknowledged for it is irrelevant mm -hmm. like but that he also simultaneously hasn't made an impact because because the film sort of got two endings, isn't it? It's got that they leave the wake and all of the men sort of you know that kind of thing where drunk people make plans about what they're going to do. And they, oh, we're all going to go on holiday tomorrow. We're all booking. We're all going to Prague, and it never happens. Um, the uh, there's a there's this thing where they all say they're all going to be different, and from now on they're going to get things done, and they're going to go headlong into their work and try and make things happen and change the world and change the way the local bureaucracies run, and they all agree on this. And then it cuts to them the next day at their office, and it's the beginning again, basically. And yeah. uh, you know, the the they're all just down doing their normal work. One of them, who's the kind of most emotional, most pro Watanabe at the wake, stands up to tell them all off and say, look, we agreed we were going to do it different. And he just gets kind of like disapproving looks and has to sit down and go back to work, kind of the hammer, the, the nail that sticks out, it's hammered back in place sort of style. And uh, so you get that ending and it could easily just say the end there and it could be very bleak and say, this man made no impact. Like he's done his little thing, but the society hasn't changed. The people haven't changed and the same crap's keeping on going on. But then it also has the, uh, the one you've mentioned as well, straight after that, where it says, but look, the kids are enjoying the park and there are those who remember him. So it sort of presents, it doesn't just present this kind of, fairy tale kind of happy ending does it it kind of shows you these two realities yeah i guess I mean, you know i've like i say I, but I, you know i work I've, I've worked with students and young people for a long time and i got a lot of faith that for me reading it it's the kids in the park enjoying it for me it's always you know the future is in youth like the people who are entrenched in their ways and how the he's not going to change the the office that's just how it is that's 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 you know let's 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 work on making the kids lives better and then 
things will unfold from there. But yeah, I, yeah. I hadn't, I didn't, I, I thought that was more, I found that more of as a funny little gag than anything else. It was, and, and, and ending on the park, you know, you can end, like you say, ending on the, on the park, you can, you can decide in the edit or in the writing, which way round those two parts of the ending go. And for me, having the park at the end is, is, is far more, that's far more um, positive and and kind of my preferred reading of it anyway. Yeah, no, I think I think you're completely right. I just think what's interesting about the film, and I think one of the reasons people applaud it for not being sentimental, which I always find a weird thing. Like I don't necessarily think sentimentality equals bad, but often in film criticism, sentimentality means bad. Uh, but like uh, in the, one of the ways in which this film is not particularly sentimental is that. Um, is that he doesn't sort of change the office that the that what the world keeps turning and that he's replaced as a, a kind of changeable cog in yeah. the machine and it keeps on being shit and you kind of feel like the the kind of spielberg version of this film would would probably have some sort of renewed vigor at the office the next day where they're kind of doing things in his name and kurosawa just goes like no like kind of like you say like that's the that's the way the world is like this is the way he's never going to change the office and i think that's one of the ways that this film this film kind of teeters for me between like realism and like magical realism you know like there are certain things in it like him on the swings and the park and and things like that that are kind of not necessarily um I don't know. I wouldn't confidently say they're like deeply social realists. They're not, they're certainly not gritty, but there's definitely realism throughout it. There's definitely lots of really well observed things about how, how yeah. life is, how society is going through the film. I don't know. I don't know if I'd call it magical realism. It's definitely romanticism. Like, yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. Because you can have that kind of, you know, we talk about social grit, you know, you can be in, you can be in the, one of the most deprived areas of the country and uh, you know on a on a on an estate that woefully understand funded estate for the deprivation and then on a certain day in january it snows and everything looks beautiful for for me it was more the fact that he's yeah, I mean, um that he's kind of gone become. yeah for me that's because it's more the magical realism side i was thinking was more the fact that there's that slightly like if you take the film as very realist it's kind of incongruous and a bit strange that, oh, how convenient. Like he leaves all his papers and then goes off to die on the swings, you know, and he just happens to die then on the swings. And it's like, but to me, that's more because it's, it's elevated beyond just realism at that point. It's become yeah. something more symbolic and, and, and magical. Yeah. This is what okay. I meant more than the, the snow is magical in of itself. Um, <laughs> no, no, he, no, I, yeah. no I meant, I, that, that's what I meant. Like um, the idea that he knows he's going to die and like, yeah okay I, I yeah i'm with you <laughs> <laughs> the uh i mean i might that might still not be magical realism but that's sort of what i was what i was thinking about with it is this is kind of the way that it goes on takes this more maybe romanticism is the better term for it but it's the way that it sort of goes off the tracks from just very bleak sort of like look at how shit the government works and yeah you, know, you get this kind of thing um but i just want to go back to yeah. what you said about sentimentality like i think you know it's people movies getting um criticized for sentimentality i think anything that there's nothing wrong with it if it genuinely makes the viewer feel sentimental like that's the point of it like you're i think if thing where things don't quite work and they feel clawing that's where it gets a bad bad mm. rap like um you know i always think about this with um with sort of blockbuster movies and action movies that are thought of um as slightly lesser uh, or, or not as valid filmmaking um, or, you know, not great films because of the genre they're in, especially when it comes to action films. Cause you can, you just think about how many like shit blockbusters that are made. Um, the ones that kind of, that actually work as thrill rides, you know, take a lot of skill, talent and thinking and, and, and filmmaking. And it's the same thing with sentimental, the ones that actually make the audience feel that sort of sentiment and that melancholia or whatever it is you know we've all seen sentimentality that hasn't quite been pulled off but when it hits you in the sweet spot like the ending of um this or the ending of something like um stand by me it's it's as good as anything yeah you know? no i i agree i agree um there was an interesting thing. We actually spoke very briefly. We, we usually don't speak about the film before we before we sort of do the episode. We spoke very briefly about, uh, we kind of joked about how it's a shame Kurosawa's autobiography's run out 
here because I'm sure there was a story about him dealing with a local bureaucrat that made him really angry to, to make the film. And actually reading Donald Ritchie's book, we don't get that. What we get instead is two things that influenced Kurosawa's making of this film, apparently. Um, one was that uh, he started very bleakly contemplating his own mortality and his own death. And he started to think about how he, and this makes me feel bad because I've not made any films. He started thinking at this stage of his career that he hadn't done anything yet. And hadn't he, he won hadn't, the Palm Door by now? With, he'd or, won, or, he, or no, he won the Golden Lion for Rashomon, didn't he, in Venice? Golden Lion. Um, uh, but he was thinking, like, I haven't done a thing with my life. I'm a complete, you know, loser. Uh, and uh, he started contemplating death and what he would do if he realised that he was going to die. And that was one of the, the impetuses. The other one, which is even more interesting, I think, is that um, when he won the Golden Lion for Rashomon, um, he said in his acceptance speech of it, apparently, uh, that um, that he wished he'd won for a film about contemporary Japan. And he didn't like the fact that the film that was being celebrated abroad was kind of so firmly rooted in the past. <laughs> and so after... Uh, uh, well, I don't think he meant it that churlishly. Like, fuck you. I just mean that, like, that, like, he saw that this film was being celebrated and thought, oh, but it'd be nicer if I was, if people were talking about what Japan's like now. So he wanted to make more of a contemporary Japanese film next. Um, which, and this kind of is his follow up to Rashomon because, um, obviously the idiot came before this, but the idiot was made, you know, while Rashomon was off going off to the awards and going to yeah. Europe and winning prizes. So basically he wins the award for Rashomon after making The Idiot. And then his next film from the award is this, you know, this is that's right. sort of the way it works. So so he, this was in a way a reaction to, to, to that win and wanting to do something more contemporary. Okay. Yeah, no, I think it's a very, very special film. And I think um, it's one of those films where sort of talking about it now for the past hour or so is actually... Not that, not that I wasn't warm to it. I thought it was fantastic, but it it kind of is enriching the more you think and meditate on it. I think it's it's a film it, film that rewards talking about and thinking about. Um, it's very very rich. Like I really really liked like because up to now I think you know my favorite my favorite of what we've seen so far is Stray Dog, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but is it's a it's a thriller it's a really well constructed thriller um and this is like this is the humanism isn't it this is that mm. he's that he's famous for this is the kind of meditation on life kind of stuff which is and you know rashomon as well which is um really sort of really a really great film a kind of an intellectual exercise to a certain extent about memory and narrative and who gets to control narrative and that kind of thing the characters themselves are difficult to define and at times cartoonish so he's kind of these the three best films that i've seen of his so far um are all very very different mm. in in what they're not only not only what they achieve, but yeah, what they're trying to achieve, I guess, and and and, and what they're about. Um, yeah, but yeah, really, really, really like this. That's really interesting. I um, yeah, I haven't really thought of that because you often think of like I don't think it's this extreme, but you often hear that with Stanley Kubrick that like you know he 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 never really repeated himself. All of his, I mean, he made a couple of war movies like early on in his career as well. He made a few war movies, but basically his movies are like horror movie, period drama, sci-fi movie, and all of them are sort of held up as some of the best in in their their genre as well um and i'm not suggesting for a minute kurosawa's doing that because his films are more of a piece than than i would say kubrick's are in terms of at least their at least the superficial side but um i hadn't considered how diverse they were really until you you mentioned that just now and actually that is really interesting they they because i mean you look at his earlier filmography as well and you do have that kind of um straight up capricorn of scandal you do get that very uh, kind of frothy romantic comedy vibes in One Wonderful Sunday. You get his gangster movie with Drunken Angel. You do quite, get quite a mix of things, don't you? It's like Soderbergh, really. It sounds like, mm. like the way that so the Soderbergh has completely different kind of concerns, names, and 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 um, it's sort of aspirations within his films. Like you, you, Soderbergh will do a frothy, um, uh, will do a frothy, um, like fun 
uh, romp thriller and then a really kind of intense psychological thriller and then we'll do the kind of the big meditation on the state of the drugs or what mm. life would be like in a pandemic or you know it, the, the, all those different it the, his ca he's he'll work on a different canvas basically um, yeah and that's i think that's a great comparison because the thing is as well is even though soderbergh someone i've heard people say doesn't really have too much of a fixed style which i disagree with i i think you can see soderbergh's fingerprints through all of those in the same way that kurosawa clearly has running preoccupations and techniques and things that he uses so i think that's a really interesting comparison i'm not sure anyone's ever compared steven soderbergh to akira kurosawa before but i think oh it's i'm sure they valid. have <laughs> it's a very valid comparison um one thing one final thing i wanted to mention from uh the reading i did around this one was um i really love takashi shimura in general and in this film and i think takashi shimura uh shows such range as well like in in um in some of them he plays very noble characters he plays the kind of gruff doctor in stray dog he's kind of arguably the cool one to mifuni square one like he he shows a lot of range and in in ikiru he becomes this kind of hunched over very croaky old man and he and I, lo I love yeah uh, 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 exactly yeah very stiff yeah. very croaky very hunched over very pitiable there are loads of very like i've got in my notes here like city lights chaplain close-ups of him where like it will just come um, to so many great bits of physical business like where like after the bit in the street where <laughs> where where one of the women in the red light district steals his hat and and with now he's uh, i think he's called the novelist so i'm just gonna call him with now yeah. um says the women around here are the greediest mammals in existence. <laughs> and he goes and buys another hat. And they go into a bar and there's a barmaid serving it. And he puts his hat on the bar and she like inspects it and he just slowly kind of puts his hands on it and brings it. <laughs> <laughs> there's also that great reaction he does when I think the lady in the strip tease has taken her top off off screen, where he just suddenly goes, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> quite fun. I, enough, well. yeah. I, I did do a tiny little bit of reading around this and apparently uh when this was released in the states originally it had a um uh a, it was given a i don't know if it was given a different name but uh yeah it was called doomed okay. <laughs> and the poster did, completely got rid of shimura and put the stripper from that scene on it instead oh and wow they, and that's they insane saw, Okay, yeah. Yeah, I've never never heard about that. That's incredible. Uh yeah, that's that's crazy. I, I also just an incidental detail before I talk more about the <laughs> thing. Um I do love as well how scandalized and impressed everyone is by his new hat. Like his new <laughs> hat gets mentioned by so many people through the movie. Like, do you remember that day turned up in that fish. hat? Yeah, like yeah, rakish hat. But anyway, but what the reason I bring it up, Shimura, because I love how he is in this film. I think he's great in this film. I think he's great in general, but I think he's great in this film. And Kurosawa in his autobiography never says a kind thing about Shimura once. In fact, every time he talks about Mifune, he talks about how Mifune is the only act in Japan who really gets it, you know, and he kind of throws Shimura under the bus quite a bit. And a lot of the times he doesn't even talk about him in relation to his films. In Ikiru, he has to talk about Shimura because he's the main actor. And um, he, uh, well, he doesn't talk about his autobiography, but these are the quotes from Donald Ritchie about, about Shimura from Kurosawa. How he, um, his only regret about the film was to Takashi to, to Shimura's performance in it, and that to, uh, that Takashi Shimura uh, he wanted a, he would have wanted more of a relaxed performance. Uh, and Takashi Shimura kind of gives a really it's over the top, very effusive performance. So mm. I thought it was interesting that Kurosawa thinks Shimura is sort of the weak link in this movie, and I wanted to just find out. I, I guess you don't agree. I just want to find out what you thought. No, 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 not at all. Like. Um... You know, some of the some of the physical business is is uh, the the is repeated, and, and and I don't think it's ever really gets cartoonish. Um, but that, that sounds like Simon and Garfunkel to me. That sounds like <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Paul Simon saying, "I write them." He just sings them, like being really. Yeah. <laughs> being, it sounds like somebody who's like a, like who knows the importance of their um, their collaborators and slightly resents it. Um, <laughs> Right, I'm going to sh share my screen for those viewing on uh, on YouTube. Um, so, no, oh. oh, there we go. So, uh, where do we go? We're on the high and low scale here. Enjoyment versus appreciation. We're gonna. Pr I'll change this axis up one of these days, and we'll rearrange them because, as you, there are flaws with this system. As you can see, it's very linear uh, progression. Where where are you currently putting Ikiru? 
It is, uh, hang on, Arthur. I'm streaming. Hang on. It's quite likely he wasn't wearing anything under that robe. <laughs> so where's uh, your uh, he's it's around about stray dog, like on stray dog, or do you enjoy it or appreciate it any more than stray dog or any less? I would say it's pretty much it's in between. It's stray Akiru dog. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So there we go. So it's top. It's top right of the quadrant. Uh, yeah. You mentioned. You mentioned. I think Rashomon enjoying... edges it for being ninety minutes long. What do you say, Rashomon? Edges it for being 90 minutes long. Right, okay, okay. Because originally you said Stray Dog, um, you enjoyed it more than Rashomon. So I'm wondering if, if Rashomon needs to come down or Stray Dog needs to go up. You said I don't know. Mm. No, I think that looks about right to me. Okay, okay, good. I mean, I, you know, I know this is a, a delicate scientific scale. But, uh, <laughs> uh, he just he just bought me some, some off-brand Oreos. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Well, there we uh, go. Yeah, so did you want to talk a little bit about this potential Bill Nye remake? Yeah, I mean, I know basically nothing about it apart from that Bill Nye's in it, and I didn't know it's 50 set until you just mentioned that. Um, but it's interesting, and I wondered what things you would expect to see remain and what things you'd expect to see change. I mean, I, for one, think that the um, hiding the cancer from him, I don't think that's the thing that will be in there. I think he'll just get told about it. Um, but and that doesn't really change anything because it's not like he there's any doubt he's got the cancer. Like he doesn't no. uh, question that. He, he I mean, assumes he does. I mean, just for um, just for um, sort of um, reference and kind of um, to sort of set the context. <laughs> Excuse me. There's not a great deal. Um, there's not uh, a great deal, kind of. Of information about it at the moment it's um being produced by stephen woolley who um produced uh oh god what did he produce um i think he produced carol um directed by oliver hermanus um it says here moffy in the endless river which i'm i'm not aware of no uh, um written so by screenplay by um Kazu Ish uh, Ishiguru, Remains of the Day and Never Let Me Go, and set to star Bill Nye and Amy Lou Wood, set in 1950s London. Okay, interesting. I mean, it's it's interesting to set it in a war period. On one hand, I think, as I said, that's on the kind of post-war period. On one hand, I think that's good because there are things about it that you can kind of keep um, more in keeping with the original in terms of the period setting and things that, that I think will more directly transfer. But on the other hand, the original film wasn't set during a period. It was contemporary. You know, it was it was a contemporary story. Uh, and it seems like is that dodging a bullet a little bit? Like they don't have to actually like risk being political because they're not criticizing like bureaucracy or government like now it's all in the past. You know, is it something like that? Like what's the I don't know. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, you're talking about sort of a few years after this, the 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 kind of establishment of the welfare state, aren't you? And social housing and and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if they'll they'll go into that in much detail. I don't know if they'll talk about like you were saying. You know, the idea of the sun going off to war. I don't know if that will come into it. Um, um, I imagine they'll lean more heavily into sort of the state of disrepair that London was in at the time, post blip. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine structurally them not doing the second half. Yeah, funeral thing. I think or, we'll get a bit more straightforward. Or structurally having that as an entire device. Yeah, device. Yeah. The thing. yeah, possibly. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's it's interesting that's been made. I wouldn't have any faith in it whatsoever if you didn't say who the writer was, just because not because those are films that I particularly love, but just because of the fact that they were sort of uh relatively highbrow, well received things when they came out. Um and my first assumption whenever anyone tells me that a British film is being made with Bill Nye or someone in is that it's going to be that very like mid tier like um you know, like Made in Dagenham or something. Like yeah. That's sort of that. That's always the bracket. Like, if you, uh, this isn't fair because there are obviously British films yeah, right but, across the spectrum. Nye, but my Bill assumption Nye, is that. Yeah. 
Bill Nye on his own, he sort of straddles the whole spectrum, doesn't he? Yeah. He can yeah. be in the, the sort of the top tier uh, melodramas, but he can also he can also be sort of the named uh, thespian in uh, the Bad Education movie or whatever, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It, so you're not you're on his own. You're not sure where he's going to. You're not be. sure where you are. If it was, see, if it was Toby Jones, you mentioned before, or even if it was Jim Broadbent, I think I'd be like much more excited about it because Bill mm. Nye, it could go either way. Uh, I'm, I am interested. I'll definitely watch it. Uh, and it's interesting as well. Like we have obviously had a, a kind of a whole gamut of um, Kurosawa adaptations directly into you know Western films, literally and <laughs> figuratively. I can smell uh, like Western. Comment. <laughs> we obviously had we obviously had that whole gamut of ones with um i actually wasn't but this is yeah that, that is a decent segue because we're doing that next <laughs> but like uh we, we we've had those ones where high and low was remade at the time around the time it came out um rashomon was remade as a film called outrage which i've never seen you get obviously your jimbo and, and seven samurai getting remade um and it's interesting kind of that we haven't really had a lot of the others done that I think deserve it. Like I said, when we watched One Wonderful Sunday, like I could really imagine One Wonderful Sunday as a uh, a breezy 90 minute low budget uh, jaunt of a, mm. a remake like being done. I think a few of them are worth remaking. So it's interesting to see that happening with Akiru. In terms of the su- the segue you mentioned, yes, his uh, his most his most <laughs> remade uh, film, The Seven Samurai, which obviously became the Magnificent Seven twice over, um, is our next port of call. Uh, and that is big really one. exciting because it's it is the big one. It's the the granddaddy of them all, um, Seven Samurai. So this is it's interesting, and it obviously took him a while to make it because it's you know it's quite a long, very um, technically intense, I suppose, film. Like it's got a lot of battles and a lot of massive things going on in it. So uh, he doesn't make a film in 1953, which is the first year since he became a director. We haven't had a Kurosawa film. So we go straight to 1954 for Seven Samurai. So well, Seven looks, Samurai... Two films long anyway, isn't it? It is, basically, yeah. He basically made two <laughs> films uh, in one there. Um, so basically, what's your opinion going in this is a weird one because with some of them like with the exception of rashomon i think all of the kurosawa films up to now you've not really known anything about them right like no, not no, really I've, known, I've known i knew i knew the i knew <coughs> excuse names me. i knew i knew the name stray dog um i think i knew the name drunken angel yeah <laughs> sanga rashomon i expected something with kiru because that it, that image does sum up um it does um that image the poster image of the of the of the swing kind of ev- ev- evokes a lot of what's going on in that seven samurai is obviously the first one you hear about especially like i think i've known about it since i was 14 or something yeah. when i first started reading film magazines i probably read about it in sight and sound or empire or something like that um and when i was 15 or 16 it was actually shown on bbc2 on um christmas day oh wow uh, uh, about 11 11 o'clock in the morning um and at that time, I used to, whatever paper we used to get, I can't remember what it was, would have like a film of the day section at the bottom, which was a big thing. And it was this kind of quite large cut. There was quite this large piece, like highlighted piece. And if you cut it out, it, and it fit perfectly on the cardboard, um, on, 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 a, on a VHS box, on a cardboard VHS box. Right. So it would fit fit it absolutely perfectly and you could sellotape it down. So if the film was something I really wanted, I would tape it, put it on a VHS. And so I had the seven samurai taped off BBC two on Christmas day on my shelf for about seven or eight years until I got rid of my VHS is never sat down to watch it. Um, and I went out for a night out in 2003, 2004 in my hometown at this new bar that had opened up and one of their gimmicks were showing films. And I sat through about an hour and a half of, of Seven Samurai with no sound on whilst what I was really doing was drinking with my friends. Um, and I think a couple of times I've, I've always thought like it was some, it was, this was one of the big ones that made me think I really need to start watching um you know, if I was going to start Kurosawa films, I need to watch Seven, Seven Samurai because I haven't seen Seven Samurai. Yeah, I think this pod even yeah. came out of. Yeah, but the two hundred minutes um, was a stumbling block. Yeah, always. Like you know, when am I going to 
sit down and, and, and watch that. And I also, I never, I was always kind of a little bit, I'm, the, I would imagine, I've, I've never had that, um, I've never had that connection to all the sort of the dad films for, that, that were on telly when we were younger, the Magnificent mm. Sevens and the Spaghetti Westerns. And I've watched some of them and I've never, I've enjoyed them, but never felt a kind of, um, connection with them exactly yeah. and i've never like sought them out really and knowing that this was kind of back and forth between this and the westerns never really that was never really something that inspired me um so it just never sat high on my kind of um i, I really want to watch this i always felt like i should watch it it always felt like it was going to be homework hmm. so it just sat on my shelf for years and then and i never ever watched it and i just yeah increasingly felt bad about not watching it <laughs> yeah because i remember i, I remember seen, you saying... i have seen ants uh, a bug's life <laughs> and i have seen the remake of the magnificent seven. Oh, okay so you have you you basically you know the story everyone yeah. knows the story uh and in fact you know for, when stray dog was on we watched an episode of star wars clone wars that was a remake there is a remake of 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 it in clone wars as well there's an episode of the mandalorian that's a remake of seven samurai basically there are there are remakes of seven samurai there's an anime series i've never watched that's like really long that's like a remake of seven samurai that re seven samurai has been that remade be stars. is that is that seven samurai as well um i'm not sure but possibly but there's loads there's loads of remakes of this one um and um yeah so this uh this is what i'm really looking forward to i've seen this more than i've seen any of the others i think despite its length and obviously like mileage may vary on this i'm really interested to hear how you feel about it but this one to me never feels long okay. like i never and i don't like a long film i like a 90 minute job no if you can come in at 80 minutes uh <laughs> that's great uh so um so yeah like i i'm the same as you in that regard and i never consider this to be very long um are you you're not what you're not watching it on like a phone or something are you like i know you no, 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 no. on like no, this, one, this one is going to be no i've not watched anything on a phone i've watched okay on, i've watched things on uh off my laptop but on a nice relatively large screen um i watched the last couple on the television um this will be I want to sit and watch this on the TV. So this is this is going to take a little bit of planning. This is a bit like when I yeah. sat down. It's a bit like when I sat down to watch The Irishman. Like I needed, I needed, a, I needed a, a quiet living room and, and a good few hours. I I, I, I might, I might split it into two parts because it seems to have an, an intermission. Um, but I, I'm going to try. I'm going to endeavour not to. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, I've I, because because I'm um, accidentally a bit of a weeb. Uh, I do have a couple of nice Japanese whiskeys, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sit down with some Japanese whiskey <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy this sometime in the week. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll do we'll certainly do this within the next two weeks. I don't know if we'll get to it next weekend because it is a, a long boy and we both need to find time to sit down and see it. But um, I'm super excited to talk about Seven Samurai, and I think um, yeah, I'm really interested to hear what you think of it when you see it. Whether or not, I mean, the key question for me is whether or not you think it's still homework that's too long, or whether you were really um, on board with it all the way through but uh yeah interesting stuff so yeah join us next time for our look at seven samurai um and uh yeah we'll we'll see you then thanks for watching